Architecture has a long history with public health. Infectious diseases, in fact, have helped shape modernist architecture. If you look at the buildings around us, they have been influenced by the tuberculosis epidemic of the last century. Everyone who works in healthcare, we know it's a team sport. It's composed of physicians, nurses, pharmacists, midwives, and many others. But should architects be part of this healthcare team? Today, we have two amazing rock star architects. I admire them so much. We have Kim Dowdell. She's with the global firm HOK and the incoming president of the American Institute of Architects. She's also a trustee of Cornell University. Fun fact about Kim is that when she was growing up in Detroit, Rosa Parks was a neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Michael Murphy, he is the Thomas Ventilet Chair of Architecture at Georgia Tech, the founder of Mass Design Group, and the author of Architecture of Health. Fun fact about Michael, he's a karaoke super fan, but he had to retire because his vocal cords got messed up and he had to have surgery from them. <laughs> true. Our first question is, tell us about your journeys as designers in health. How did you get into this space as architects? Do you want me to start? Thank you, Bon. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. It's great to be back here in Aspen. Yeah, my, my journey to, uh, to, to health and design was really, like many of us, a pretty personal one. When I was a student um, in my first year of architecture school, um, it was actually my first final review, which is this, if, you're in the, if you know of the design pedagogy, this incredible kind of all-nighter experience where you work for multiple days on charrette, they call it, and you kind of present your design of some new um, you know, uh, building or whatever. And so I was up for kind of three days, and I walked out of my final review where I'd gotten kind of beat up and butchered by my uh, faculty, and I had um, like 50 missed calls from my mother. And, uh, you know, strange, I'm on Charette and I hadn't checked my phone in like three days. And so my first, my first message was, uh, where are you? My father, who had been uh, in remission with cancer, had um, now uh, gone into septic shock and they were in uh, an ambulance. The second call was, you know, please pick up. The third and fourth, I didn't know what the 50th one was. Um, and I just, at the very moment, had this incredible experience where I was like, you know, what could, you know, what has happened in this period where I've been focusing on what might be called kind of irrelevant investigations. Uh, just at that moment, a friend of mine ran into the school. My mother had called her and she came to find me and said, I'm going to pick you up. We're going to drive to New York from Boston uh, and go to the hospital. Uh, fortunately, my father was alive, but he was in a tough shape and going into surgery. I showed up at the hospital and uh, I also had this kind of overwhelming kind of experience where the hospital and the medical team had done this incredible work to save his life, but the experience of being in that space was one that was really quite bleak. There was no windows, there were um, these kind of austere surfaces, the sound was bouncing all over the, the place, and my father, I remember him saying, this place is really kind of terribly designed. And I just kind of thought about, like, this could be the place where he might pass away, and this could be the last thing he sees. And why, why is it that all the things I was learning about the beauty and power and possibility of design was not in the place where it was needed the most, where uh, we might face some of our greatest existential crises? And I had this moment of realization, if I ever become an architect, I would love to work on a hospital and try to change that. So that was my first journey through health. Great. Kim? So my journey started a little bit earlier in life for me. Actually, originally, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, I was influenced by my grandmother who had studied nursing, um, didn't end up pursuing nursing, but she actually uh, volunteered for the Children's Hospital of Michigan for like 37 years. So growing up, I saw her you know, put on her jacket with her little hospital logo and go to the hospital and, and help out with whatever she was helping with. So that was what inspired me to become a doctor. But at age 11, I had a change of heart. So uh, growing up in Detroit, this is the early 90s, there was a lot of disinvestment that impacted the buildings, the built environment. And so I remember this distinct moment in downtown Detroit, uh, looking at the, uh, the old Hudson's department store, which had been around for about 100 years, um, and, but it closed the year that I was born. So it wasn't a place of commerce anymore, it was just sort of this relic of the past. Beautiful building, it took up a full city block, and, um, but it had boarded up windows, broken windows, graffiti, everything that was sort of emblematic of um, you know, a, a community in distress. And so I just learned what an architect did in a middle school art class, and I said, 
well, if architects work on buildings, I would like to work on this building, which I think can have an impact on healing the community. So in, in a way, I sort of saw architects as, as sort of doctors for the larger community. So that's uh, not entirely how this works, I learned. But um, <laughs> here we are. Um, but I've always had an interest in how the built environment impacts our mental health, our physical health. Um, I work for a large global firm, HOK, that works on lots of hospitals, but I think it's about more than just hospitals and healthcare. I think it's about the entire sort of ecosystem, the, the built environment, the natural environment, how they all come together. So that's the beginning of my journey. And um, yeah, just excited to be here to talk about the connection between health and design. Because we have two architects on the panel, we need some images. So let's pull up the first one. The architects are visual thinkers. Uh, the first two, I think, are f uh, yours, Kim. So do you want to yeah. um, walk us through some of these images that you have? Thank you. So as I mentioned, I am from Detroit, Michigan, but I actually moved to Chicago in 2019. So now I kind of split my time between the, the two cities. I'm a dual citizen, as I like to call it. Um, but one of the things that's really striking about uh, the city of Chicago, and actually, frankly, a lot of cities around the U.S. have similar dynamics, but Chicago seems to have uh, one of the more drastic uh, life expectancy differences. Um, and so if you look at the, the images that are um, in front of us, um, you'll see a few different gaps. Um, there's uh, the Chicago food desert. So it, basically, these are heat maps of where um, you know, there's the greatest prevalence of food deserts, which is basically where it's difficult to, to find food, um, unemployment. So the, the darker, basically the worse, is, is kind of the, the way that works. And then the one in the middle is what is really troubling to me and should be troubling to all of us. And I don't know how well you can see it, but essentially, on the north side of Chicago, which is a predominantly uh, white community, uh, the average life expectancy is around 90 years old. Um, but on the south side and the west side, which are predominantly communities of color, the average life expectancy is around 60 years old. And so we're talking about a 30-year gap. And so I think it's important for all of us, architects, doctors, everyone else, to kind of have serious conversations about how we got here. How did we, um, you know, it, how did we get to this kind of disparity? And more specifically, what can we do to help close those gaps? So those are some of the things that I've been thinking about for a long time. And when I saw this image, um, you know, every time I lecture, oftentimes I will talk about what we can do to, uh, to help address that issue. And so uh, one of the other things I think it's important to, that's important to note are you know, there are some ways that we can um, you know, move the needle on closing that gap. And that's driven by the social determinants of health. So there are five of them. But the one that I'm hyper-focused on is the neighborhood and built environment piece, which is um, very much a part of what, what architects you know, have some agency over. So um, you know, I think about uh, the fact that you know, there are 121,000 licensed architects in the United States. Uh, there are actually more attorneys just in the state of California. So we're a small but mighty profession. Um, but we can be empowered um, to, to help address some of these issues. And so looking at how we can influence the the built environment in our neighborhoods and communities, and um, you know, certainly working on hospitals and, and, and great projects that help to um, care for people when they get sick. But how do we help um, prevent people from needing to go to the hospital in the first place? So those are some of the, some of the things that we're exploring within uh, the American Institute of Architects. Uh, we have our CEO here, Lakeisha, who often says, architects are your partners for progress. And part of my role as president next year is to really elevate that message. Great. Michael, next slide. Oh yeah, thank you, Kim. That's amazing. Um, well, so I did eventually um, uh, carry that dream forward. I, soon after my father recovered from uh, uh, that treatment, uh, I had the great um, privilege to meet the, this amazing doctor who's um, we all uh, kind of know here named Paul Farmer, Dr. Paul Farmer, and his organization Partners in Health. And he was giving a talk uh, uh, that I went to, and he was talking about all the work that his organization is doing around the world, but he was talking about buildings. He was saying, we're building clinics and, and hospitals, we're also building housing. Um, and one crucial thing he said was, if we don't build enough housing for the people that we're serving, the, the, the drugs aren't going to work, the care isn't going to work, we can't treat the whole person unless they have a place to live. That idea, the social determinants of health have a spatial indicator, have a spatial are spatially reliant, this notion of neighborhood and built environment that Kim uh, is showing here uh, does affect our health outcomes. And Paul was proving that through building, you know, creating crucial investments in infrastructure uh, beyond the hospital itself. So I went up to him after the lecture, I said, who are the architects you work with? How am I get involved? And he said, you know, architects have never reached out to see how they can serve us and our needs and be with us on the ground, be proximate with us. 
and that there's a gap for where the professional, uh, professionals are being hired and where in really, really disadvantaged communities, uh, professionals are needed. Um, and so that started a conversation um, where I then, instead of going to work at an architecture firm, I went and worked at Partners in Health uh, in their um, initiative to rebuild the health infrastructure of Rwanda uh, in East Africa. And the first project that I got to work on was this uh, hospital, which I'll show here. Uh, this hospital, I worked within Partners in Health uh, to design for the government of Rwanda and um, as a new kind of flagship center that would showcase a new investment in health infrastructure for the whole country and address the kind of discrepancies they're facing after the end of the genocide in 1994, they're still recovering. Uh, in this case, in this hospital, one of the big ideas though was we didn't have enough resources to be, have big uh, mechanical systems and we thought about, uh, in the, sorry, in the disease here was uh, tuberculosis or multidrug resistant tuberculosis, which um, uh, is a disease transmitted through the airborne route. So the questions we were having and this is how I started my organization, Mass Design Group, uh, and an incredible group of folks that worked on, uh, with me on this, so I, I wanna give credit to them, um, is how do we design a building that can breathe to reduce the transmission of, of this disease, which uh, affected buildings, like Bond said, even here on this campus, but buildings around the world. And we used to think that way, and we don't any longer, so this building could breathe to reduce airborne infection rates and get enough airflow so that we wouldn't be getting patients sicker inside of the facility itself. Of course, a building isn't just about how it performs, it's also about what it represents. And so this other piece of the building is that it was made from these uh, stones, this local volcanic rock stone of this place. And we work with these incredible masons, these artisans to handcraft each one of these stones uh, into this incredible facility that comes out of the ground and um, really represents this place, the environment, um, but also the, the kind of beauty and dignity that's necessary for uh, 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 for these spaces that are, are really kind of crucial to our care journey. The kind of same conclusions I came to with my father, like where is the dignity in these spaces? Why are these so undignified? If we're gonna treat the whole person, could we be investing in not just the facility's performance, but also uh, how it's made and, and the stories of those individual masons? So you can see that here, and we're like really in love with this and the story of these masons. I'll show a few more slides really quickly, and then I think we'll get to conversation. Um, D disease turns out to be a driver of architecture in a big way. I, after this, got introduced to the um, challenges that Haiti was facing after the earthquake, including the cholera epidemic, and uh, worked with a, a nonprofit in, in Haiti to build their first permanent cholera treatment center. That's what this is. Cholera is a different disease. It's waterborne. So how does the building respond to a, um, a waterborne disease instead of an airborne disease? Well, we can actually collect all the contaminated waste and decontaminate it here on site, which is what this building is. It's basically a wastewater treatment system uh, underneath a medical clinic. Um, and so bringing those things together are thinking really critically about how the building specifically addresses health, uh, health problems or health challenges. Um, healing in a broader sense also is not just about our bodies, but it's about uh, our, our minds and our nation and historic trauma. So I also was working on other types of projects, including this amazing memorial that I worked on with Brian Stevenson in, um, in Montgomery, Alabama, this memorial to victims of lynching, African-Americans who were lynched in the United States. This memorial uh, really is, I mean, it was an incredible privilege to work on this with Brian um, and of course my amazing team at Mass Design Group who worked on this. And uh, we've seen transformative change after this was built, not only in the city of Montgomery, but a kind of national dialogue about spaces of memory and healing in our communities that are repairing historic injustices and bringing dialogue and conversation to our nation around things we need to invest in in order for us to overcome the history of trauma and injustice and racism of our, of our past. And we can talk about that a little bit. The last two are uh, two other memorials. This is a memorial to victims of gun violence in America, of course, again, about trauma and healing. Um, it's these glass houses filled with objects that were um, contributed by victims, family members. It started in Chicago uh, for the Chicago Architecture Biennial. And um, we collect all these objects and put them in, um, in these spaces as a way to tell the stories of these individuals through empathy, through storytelling, we bring back um, an opportunity to kind of see the whole person and be able to heal, ideally, from some of these historic challenges. And finally, I just wanted to show the, this memorial we just finished uh, with, uh, again, my amazing team, uh, John Evans and other folks at the Mass Design Team, uh, and the amazing artist, Hank Willis Thomas. This is a Martin Luther King, Credit Scott King memorial in Boston called The Embrace, which has been all over the news <laughs> in interesting conversations, and um, <laughs> we love it. And it's bringing people together to embrace each other and, uh, and really talk about how we build the kind of 
reparative spaces in our cities uh, that tell the whole story of our nation. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for those slides. Um, Kim, you have an important role coming up as president of the AIA. Can you tell us about the vision that you have around uh, design, architecture, and health? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll start with um, our two key strategic priorities, which are climate action and, and equity. So a lot of um, our initiatives are really centered around those two items. But um, you know, personally, just given my background that I, I just mentioned, I'm really interested in health and really elevating the conversation around how architects can participate in uh, you know, closing some of these health gaps and creating healthier communities. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking at um, is, is you know, creating convenings around health and, again, elevating these conversations. And, you know, it's wonderful to be invited here to Aspen Ideas Health, but how do we have this conversation outside, um, you know, in our communities where, you know, the places where these issues are, are most um, prevalent? And so, you know, just working with my colleagues at, at AIA to, to fil facilitate that over the next year is something that's really, uh, really important. Um, one of the things that, that's important to note is that um, architects, Technically, like our duty is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And it has nothing to do with aesthetics and design or making things beautiful. Yes, that's part of what we do. Um, I think architecture at its best elevates the human experience. And so, you know, we're all trying to do that in different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, we're technically responsible for protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So really talking about that um, in different ways is, is something that's going to be really important, um, not just next year when I'm president, but, you know, going forward. So hopefully um, you all will engage architects in, in your various capacities to, to really extract some of the knowledge and experience that we have. Uh, something people probably also don't know is it takes on average about 12 years to become a licensed architect. It's a very uh, intense training and um, you know, experience that, that's required in testing. And a lot of the testing has to do with health, safety, and welfare. And so really um, encouraging people to tap into that um, experience that we have so that we can help solve some of our most complex problems. So those are things that come to mind, but I'm sure new things will pop up as, as the year goes on. Our, our human experience has not been so great globally. Uh, from the pandemic over the past couple of years. So I'm curious to know uh, how you think COVID has or will change the design of cities, because as we mentioned before, diseases are the most powerful architects of cities. So either of you can answer that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think we've just all collectively gone through this amazing <laughs> shared experience, what I would call a, a, this kind of spatial awakening. Mm -hmm. Across the globe, we've all now suddenly experienced what it's like to be in a space and be afraid of the other people around us, to be afraid of diseases we can't see circulating in the air, to be asking questions about where is the airflow, where's the window, how do we actually modulate the built environment around us, the space around us, so that we can actually feel healthy, feel safe, feel protected? Or are we walking into spaces and being contaminated, being put into danger? We don't know. That is a radical change in the way that we understand the role of the built environment in our everyday lives. And we've all just experienced that. I think we're at this primed moment to see buildings, things we set, spend 90% of our lives in. We spend 90% of our living lives inside of buildings. How are they not shaping us in transformative and powerful ways? Well, COVID was a really clear example of how they're shaping us and, and potentially risking our health. Um, but it necessitates a series of questions around how else are they shaping us and how th could they shape us in a better and more productive and more healthy way. So I think we're kind of primed for this moment to say COVID can actually accelerate um, a spatial awakening and a spatial vocabulary uh, for the public to sort of demand more of our buildings. So not just uh, have enough air movement, as we learned in Rwanda, but I think we're learning now in COVID, air movement that we don't have contaminating diseases around us, but also um, to, de to sort of demand buildings be intentionally and pur purposefully designed for our everyday needs. So like in the hospital, for example, that it serves our whole person, that it's some place that's beautiful and dignified and humane. Uh, the housing that we live in, that uh, it's not just getting light and air and keeping us healthy, but it's made with materials that aren't contaminating the environment around us or using uh, systems that aren't uh, further injuring our neighbors. I think that all of these things are related to how the built environment affects our lives and, uh, and the kind of lives of people around us, and I think we have a window into how we might demand more from that now. What about going beyond the building, looking at the actual design and layout of cities? Is that going to be changed by COVID? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the things that COVID did was it really highlighted those disparities. So the map that I showed earlier, that was actually from 2019. 
Um, but what we learned from COVID is that those same areas that were the darker red, um, th that's where we experienced the most loss, that's, or the fatalities that, um, you know, that, that COVID um, you know, uh, facilitated. And so I think in terms of how we look at cities, uh, one of the things, you know, to kind of um, answer your question, I think we have to, um, we have to think more creatively around what, what's located where, what's missing from our communities, where, where are the gaps, where are the needs. And so one of the other things uh, that, that I'm really advocating for uh, within uh, the AIA, in fact, I had an opportunity to speak at the U.S. Conference of Mayors earlier this year, and, you know, I shared that um, you know, I, I firmly believe that every city in the U.S. should have a chief architect, uh, someone to serve as a key advisor to our mayors and civic leaders um, to understand the, the impact of, of this, the decisions that are being made around the built environment. So I think, um, you know, every, every set of problems are, are, are hyper-local, so I won't make broad recommendations, but I think it's important to listen to the communities that are suffering the most in, in whatever ways and find local, locally-based solutions. I, I really believe in the, the genius of the local. People you know, know how to solve their own problems. They may not have the resources or you know, they might need some assistance, but finding ways to get to those communities to help you know, answer some of the questions um, you know, that, that, uh, that have come up around how do we improve our, our health outcomes. Mm -hmm. I work in a hospital in the emergency room. Hospitals are some of the ugliest places I, I think that I have worked in. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit about beauty before. Does beauty matter in health? Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, well, the obvious answer is yes. It matters in a huge way, um, uh, and I think we've we've kind of been um, conditioned to think that beauty is something that we. Um, don't deserve or have to pay extra for. And so architects getting pulled into this uh, role where they're playing this sort of extra, extra purpose of making something nice and putting lipstick on the pig, I said really diminishes the conversation that we have around what's the role of a well-designed built environment, a beautifully built environment, a beautiful room for the restoration of our, our being, of our souls, of just giving us a sense of comfort and pause and inspiration, a sense of dignity, a sense that we deserve this, a sense that we matter in the world. Beauty is that sort of direct main line to suggesting that you actually matter, right? That dignity is something that designers, I think, produce in this pr profound and powerful way. And without it, we have to ask the question, what is the, what is the cost of not having that dignity invested in our built environment? Mm -hmm. Paul Farmer said this to me early. He said, we shouldn't be asking what's the question of the cost of architecture. We should be asking what's the cost of not having architecture. And if we start to calculate those social determinants of health, then we may be calculating a very different ledger for the effect and uh, the disinvestment in our communities uh, and to the people around us. I'll tell one small story if that's okay, because I thought it was really illustrative for me in my own journey of understanding the power of beauty and the essential right to beauty, which I think is a better way to talk about that, which is in that same stone wall story, um, which was made with these amazing masons, there was this doctor working uh, with, over there at the time in, in Rwanda, he's an amazing cardiologist, and uh, I had known him, we were kind of friendly, and he would always kind of be poking and prodding me while I was in working on the drawings and stuff, because I was this volunteer uh, inside the organization working on the design. And he was sort of asking questions and saying, do you really know how to make an operating theater? And what are you really doing here? And this sort of thing, give me a kind of a hard time. Uh, years later, I was at this fundraising event for the organization, and uh, that same cardiologist came up to me and he goes, you know, I want to confess something to you. I, he said, when, I, when we first met in Rwanda and you were working on this building, I thought uh, it was a huge waste of time and resources and I thought you shouldn't be there. <laughs> so that's why I was kind of a jerk. You know? <laughs> and he said, but then when I went to the finished, design, finished project and I went to the hospital and I saw the stone wall, he mentioned the stone wall in particular, he said, I got it, I understood why we needed to do this. And then I started to think about all the examples where we didn't invest in the making of the place and the beauty of the place because it gives inspiration to our patients. And it totally changed, he said, it totally changed the way he thinks about the role of uh, investing in design and architecture and how essential it was to serve what he said, the whole person. I was like, wow, it's so nice of you to apologize and say something so profound and validate what we were doing. Thank you very much. But anyway, he was a, a really incredible story for me to say that, like, actually, this is not just a nice to have, it's a must have, right? And it's actually a storytelling device. We remember the stone wall more than we remember the airflow strategy of the mechanical system or lack thereof. So these two things are going hand in hand. And when we walk away from a space that maybe somebody 
had saved our lives or we had or more challenging circumstances, we're gonna remember those stories. They're gonna carry them, we're gonna carry them with us. And we're never gonna forget the places that we went where we had these life-changing experiences. Yeah, and and I would yeah. just add, um, you know, I think about, I uh, participated in the Mayor's Institute on City Design uh, a little over a year ago. And uh, that basically pairs designers, architects, planners with, uh, with mayors to kind of solve, you know, a particular issue that a, a mayor might present to the group. And I remember the mayor of Monroe, Louisiana, Mayor Friday Ellis with a big cowboy hat and a great Southern accent, um, he presented the slides of, of sort of some of the before and after images of what were happening, you know, the things that were happening in, in Monroe, Louisiana. And he said something I, I don't think I'll ever forget. He's like, see beautiful, feel beautiful. And yeah, I wish we had more research around, um, you know, how us sort of taking in a beautiful environment, you know, the natural environment, obviously, but the built environment, the, the environment that we're mostly a part of, you know, how that impacts our health, how that impacts our psyche, how that impacts our physical health. Um, and so one of the things I'd encourage us to think about uh, are, are ways that we can actually invest in some of that research so that we can, because I really do think that if we solve some of these built environment issues, it will go a long way for our um, you know, our, our health outcomes overall, so. I, I wanna continue on that thread. Why isn't there more funded research done on looking at the impact of the built environment on actual health outcomes? It intuitively makes sense, but there seems to be a big knowledge gap in the research around this. Well, I think the video from this session hasn't happened yet, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, there just, there just hasn't been enough conversation. So I think it's, it's important to elevate this discussion and make sure that people know that there is a correlation and then get people passionate about raising the funds, you know, pursuing the grants to, to actually do that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it takes, it's, it's a great question of wh why it is. I'm not 100% sure, but I know that if we did invest and we did have institutions investing in the relationship between design and health more directly, like the institution that Bon is, leads at his uh, hospital, uh, Thomas Jeff Jefferson University reads, leads a design lab where he's both an ER a doctor as well as looking at design solutions and research around how design can improve health outcomes. These are the kinds of collaborations in institutions we need more of. Uh, we're seeing some of it emerge, but we need to spend heavy resources on, on data uh, um, collection, on uh, you know, blind studies on uh, getting researchers really directly in the, the built environment and asking hard questions. I've been really fortunate to work with amazing doctors who, you know, are always asking questions around outcomes and data and proof. And so it's always pushed me as an architect and designer into a space to say, well, do we have evidence of that? And one of our friends, the amazing Dr. Neil Shaw, uh, came to me after a lecture once. He said, he's an OBGYN doctor. And he said to me, you know, I have this hunch that um, the design of the maternity floor of hospitals is actually leading to um, the rates of cesarean section that, w that hospitals are, are causing in, in, in mothers. And I don't see any other correlation between quality of the hospital or quality of care. It's really the size and shape of the floor, of the unit, that I think is causing this kind of behavioral modification to force women into cesarean sections, potentially when we don't need to. And so we did a study across the United States, uh, which actually uh, validated that hypothesis that the certain design of a certain threshold of size uh, is actually causing enough pressure on the medical professionals to actually throw women into ces cesarean section more rapidly than the kind of hand-in-hand uh, uh, -hand care that they're needed to work through difficult pregnancies or difficult births. Um, it was a fascinating study and there was a hunch of a doctor who had this in mind and then we need more of that and we had to get, we had to raise money, Robert Wood Johnson funded that study, we had to, you know, uh, kind of continue that, and, but that study alone, that simple publication has now made its way to all these facilities folks at hospitals, and they're saying, okay, we now know a little bit more about the maternity floor. We want to design it around low C-section rates, and here are some examples that we can point to where it's been successful and effective. Yeah, and I would, I would just add two other quick examples. Um, so the American Institute of Architects, we have knowledge communities that are, are focused on healthcare. And I happen to sit on the strategic council this year leading up to my presidential year. And we have uh, work, you know, areas of study or, or working groups that are, uh, one specifically that I sit on is focused on uh, health and well-being. And so we, we're doing these studies, volunteer time, frankly, that, you know, that will get us only so far. So I, I think we really do need investment. And then I think about individual firms. I can speak from the perspective of, of HOK. We do have, you know, a small amount of, of research dollars, but it really comes out of our profit. So there's only so much we can do. Um, and then we've also invested in, a, in have actually having a chief medical officer. Uh, actually, you both know him, Dr. Andrew Ibrahim. So, so I think it's important that for 
that firms really invest in that, but there's only so much we can do without sort of the broader community chipping in. I hang out with a lot of architects. You think very differently than me as a physician. We have a lot of healthcare workers in the audience. Um, what can our community of healthcare workers learn from architects or architecture? I, <laughs> I usually flip it the other way around, Bon. I think we learn the most. I think we, I have so much to learn from medical professionals. In fact, most of the architectural, architectural lessons I've learned is from working you know, uh, in community with these medical professionals who are making architectural and design decisions every day. Where's the first place we look? We look where how nurses are kind of hacking their nursing station or the equipment that they're using because we know in those uh, like uh, design hacks are real examples of, uh, of where maybe the built environment or the product isn't serving its full use or full need for, the, for how the nurse, nursing staff works. In the outbreak of COVID, I was working with Mount Sinai Hospital and their research team right in the middle of, uh, in, in New York, right in the middle of the outbreak in April 2020. And uh, they were asking questions about um, how the space of the facility, of the space of the hospital is rapidly being basically re-architected by the medical staff uh, in order to address this epidemic outbreak. And are we doing, and they were asking questions of, are we doing it correctly? Are we putting more people at risk? Do we really know? Uh, how we should be affecting the space, and are, can we make everyone more spatially aware? So we did a really quick study. We strapped GoPros to, uh, to staff uh, and to doctors. Um, we, we didn't go into the hospital, but we were able to monitor it. Uh, we were taking images of, um, of, uh, of how they were changing the hallways and changing the rooms, and, and then we're able to kind of create some quick suggestions and, and quick ideas around how the space can be quickly converted in order to be uh, more protected and more safe uh, and we know where the, where the contaminated air is a little bit more effectively. We can visualize it or be made spatially aware. And those conversations were super productive, but we were learning all about it from how the doctors were changing in real time the space around them. So, so my response to that is, and I'll give you all a little bit of insight about architecture school. So to become an architect, you have to do at least five, six, or seven years, depending on the path that you take. So I did a five-year program. So I had 10 semesters of, uh, of design studio, and there were lots of other classes that, that supplemented that. But in design studio, you're given a problem, in some cases, several different problems throughout the semester, um, but a, you know, a major issue that you need to solve, and you iterate over and over and over. You, get, you, um, you present your work. You receive criticism, you go back, you do it again. And so one of the things I think um, you know, healthcare workers can, can learn from that is you know, just the power of design, the power of, of questioning things and, and iteration. Um, the other thing about architecture school is oftentimes you're, uh, you're challenged to turn things upside down. Like you might present, oh, this is my project, here's a model, and the professor will like turn it upside down, like what about this? And so you're like, what is happening? Um, and so you know, just thinking about things in different ways uh, is you know, a big part of what our superpower is as, as designers. And so uh, the other thing that we uh, don't always do is like follow the rules. So we talked in our kind of prep session about not um, asking Bon any question or about asking Bon some questions. I'm gonna actually ask him a question. So Bon, tell us about, <laughs> tell us about your work at Thomas Jefferson and, and the work that you get to do with design and health. Like we just want, like I would like to, Share that with the audience too. We started the first design thinking program in a medical school and part of the inspiration was um, hanging out with some architects and thinking, seeing their research methods and how there's this whole field called evidence-based um, uh, design. And I was just struck by how I never thought about the actual physical layout of a hospital and how that can impact burnout in healthcare staff or that can impact um, the experience and our healing as, as humans. And uh, to flip it back on you both, uh, as, as humans, we get sick from acute and chronic disease, and we, but the spaces that we recover and heal in are often so inhumane. How can we make those spaces better? How can we humanize those spaces? Well, I think some of the things we've been talking about already, about um, thinking about the entire environment, I'd like to sort of always tap into the question of what's the kind of sensory landscape that we're in? What does it feel like? What is, what is it, can you touch it and, and kind of feel warm in the space? What does it smell like? What does the sound like? What do you see? I, I often go back to some of the architecture of the early part of the 20th century um, before the introduction of mechanical systems, because architects were really thinking about the entire environment. There's a great example in, in Finland by the great architect Alvar Aalto. 
He designed a sanatorium for tuberculosis patients. And when you look at the details of everything he designed, he, designed, he thought about the patients laying in bed and what they were looking at. He said, well, we don't want patients to have to see um, a, like a bold light bulb and want there to be kind of soft light. So he created these indirect uh, reflective lights on the ceiling uh, that he com you know, designed from scratch and so that their, what they saw, the kind of light in the room would be really carefully considered and the colors of the walls would be carefully considered. Tuberculosis patients are coughing and uh, sputum and so he actually designed new sinks to reduce sound of both water and sputum that's being collected so that the patients who are in the room, the kind of double bedrooms, patients would be um, not affected by the sound. He's, he thought about the dust and cleaning the spaces, so he, all the spaces were curved, and the closet was a curved closet, which behind, uh, the, the linen closet was behind this curved wall um, so that no dust would get in, uh, into the linen closet and you could clean the space like that. He was thinking about the entire sensory landscape, and I think it's a good example of maybe what was missing from that first hospital I was in. We thought about some of the pieces, but not all of the pieces, and when we're um, kept from having our entire sensory environment thought of, um, what are we losing? What are we missing? We need data to show what we've, kind of the stress levels that we're experiencing, the, the loss of potential healing opportunities, or just the, um, just the kind of how we remember that experience. I think there's a lot we can do uh, to change the kind of landscape of any environment, but in particular medical spaces, um, and we should think first about our senses. Mm. And I, I would add that intentionality is really important. Sort of noting what, you know, what the challenges are, actually talking to patients, doing these surveys, and, and things that help us understand um, you know, what, what we can do better, and then actually you know, finding the budget, uh, the resources otherwise to, to do that. Um, I think about when I first started at, uh, at HOK, I was in the New York office in 2008, we were working on uh, the Harlem Hospital. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar, um, it's a really beautiful uh, pavilion that was built next to the original uh, Harlem Hospital on Lenox and 135th Street, which has this beautiful mural that, that's sort of, um, you know, placed on the glass. And it, it's actually uh, looking at, uh, it's a replication of a, an image that was uh, part of the, the tunnels that were underneath uh, the ground for, uh, for many years, part of the WPA sort of arts program. But they decided to, to actually um, put that image on the facade of the building. And so, you know, it's this iconic project that um, you know, that really signifies, you know, how important design and art. And so, yes, that's an external um, example of art, but also just looking at the way that we engage, um, you know, architects are generally responsible for the, for the building, but engaging interior designers, engaging landscape architects, engaging artists to actually, you know, animate the spaces, just being really intentional about, you know, bringing everyone together to create the outcomes that, um, that will ultimately create the most healthy spaces. Uh, r really quickly before we go into Q&A, um, if I'm sitting in the audience, how do I work with architects, like practically? Great question. Well, every, almost pretty much every major location has an AIA component. So we have over 206, um, well, over 200 components across the globe. So that, as a first step, um, reach out to your local AIA component. Um, but also, I mean, Google's a great resource. You know, look, look up, you know, wherever you are, I mean, there's going to be an architect somewhere. And so just you know, reach out and, you know, we're happy to answer questions and um, find, find solutions to, to your, you know, to your challenges. I actually think of it, I think that's a really important answer. And my experience has been putting architects in uncommon conditions where they're not really valued. <laughs> uh, so, um, and I've found that architects at the table or like designers at the table are able to just, you know, not even add value, listen in ways that might come be, become a kind of spatial response in the future. All of the work that I've done in my career uh, have largely been from folks who've never used architects and never seen that they deserve to use architects and deserve and can afford architects. So uh, the kind of insertion of more architects into dialogue and community, um, uh, I think produces really potential opportunities that we may not have thought about in, the, in uh, uh, prior. I sometimes say when you think you need a building, you're maybe too late for the architect, that actually we're of valuable kind of systems thinkers, and, uh, and that's sometimes a kind of strategy role that's played um, to create the project from scratch. Um, so I often encourage folks to volunteer, go back to their hometowns, insert themselves into conversations, listen really carefully, and then see the spatial manifestations of possible problems and solutions instead of saying, I'm going to wait for, uh, wait to be hired as the only way to get to practice. Yeah, one other thing I would add, I, I mentioned the Chief Architect Initiative for our cities, but getting architects involved in, you know, local organizations, local boards, 
city council, things like that. Just having that creative thinking as a part of the, the conversations that are solving some of our more complex problems, I think um, that's a good, good way to kind of um, get that creative thinking into our systems. We can take some questions from the audience. Raise your hand and a mic will come to you magically. How oh. uh, about in the, in the front row, Arthur. Hi, um, I'm Arthur Evans. I'm the CEO for the American Psychological Association. Obviously, there are a lot of connections between behavioral science and architecture, and you, you talked about some of those. But what I wanted to ask is the, the graphic that you showed about the disparities in, um, in Chicago. Uh, you see those same kind of disparities in most parts of the country. And what I was thinking about when you were talking about that is, OK, the environment is already built. Uh, and I always think about architecture, architects as folks who are helping before the environment is built or they're helping to create the environment. So I'm really wondering how you think about your role in helping to address that. What is it that an architect can do in that? And then how can you partner with health professionals, psychologists, uh, other medical professionals to do that? Yeah, thank you for the question. One of the first things that come, comes to mind um, is you know, the, the notion that a lot of those communities that are in the sort of darker red areas of that, that image where health outcomes are, are, are less optimal, um, you know, there's a lot of blight, there's a lot of disinvestment. And so how do we, you know, work with our, our civic leaders, you know, looking at uh, public-private and not-for-profit um, collaboration models where we can find ways to reactivate these spaces, where we can eliminate the blight, where we can, you know, really improve the conditions. Uh, I think that's really uh, an important sort of component of, of the solution. Um, and, and I think also just having these conversations, doing the research that helps to kind of unlock other resources uh, that will, will help us, um, you know, again, I think blight elimination is a big deal. Um, you know, just the impact that has on our psyche, which I can't speak about with numbers because we don't have the data yet, but we'll get that hopefully at some point um, before too long. Um, and then also just the notion that the most sustainable building is the one that already exists. So how do we leverage, you know, the, the great building stock that, that is already in existence in our communities? Again, reactivate them, provide that investment, but also importantly, not pushing out the people who've been there for the long run. So just trying to strike the right balance, finding the resources to, to do all of those things come to mind. But uh, let's get some more questions. How about in the back over there? Yep. Hi there. Just uh, I'm Kathy Regan from the Commonwealth Fund. Just building on that, on your last comment, um, Kim. Obviously, it's very hard for new buildings and for healthcare institutions to be built these days with certificates of need and whatnot. But increasingly, climate is a big challenge for healthcare institutions as as anchor <laughs> institutions and communities. How can hospitals think about building resilience into their own um, architecture and existing building structures? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think that, you know, reaching out to architects, I know HOK does a, a lot of work in the space of resilience and regenerative design. Um, and so thinking about, um, you know, how we can leverage our, our available resources to build systems of resilience. And, you know, I, I don't know, Michael, if you have specific, because Michael actually works on hospitals directly, but um, I mean, I think it's super important that we think about resilience, um, but we, you know, we also have to, to find the, the resources to actually afford those, those modifications, because to your point, um, you know, new buildings are very difficult to, to you know, bring to fruition. So if you I mean, have some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, thanks for bringing up climate. I mean, it, it, I assume most of you know the built environment is responsible for about 40% of all carbon emissions. So there is like no climate solution without engaging the, the, what I would call more broadly the spatial disciplines. And the challenge of um, addressing this huge crisis is going to be in building new infrastructure, uh, retrofitting old infrastructure where your carbon uh, equation, your carbon ledger has been paid. Um, and I think you mentioned hospitals, how can they be more um, kind of forward thinking, I think hospitals are always the space where you see the kind of forward thinking architecture because it's always trying to address the current conditions of today. The book that um, I have for sale, it's a little picture of the, uh, the architecture of In health. The tent next door. <laughs> I, I look at the history of hospital design as being actually the space where big questions of like what the built environment should be are tested at the medical space itself. So there's an important intersection of social determinants of health and the environmental justice questions that we're facing, and hospitals should be the place where we test them because there's such huge energy producers, such carbon emitters, and uh, it's not, you know, the market currently doesn't support um, 
infrastructure and buildings that are, are fully uh, kind of carbon neutral or climate positive, we have to create a market for it. We have to seed a market, and hospitals can be a place where we can seed that. So I think it's a, they're always on the front line of asking big questions around our, our human and natural environment, and, and we should sort of push them forward. There's spaces of hope, there's spaces of innovation. Uh, they don't always meet the mark, but there's examples in the past where they have, and we can look to that. And that's where we could use more research attention, frankly. So it's a great time question. for one more question. How about pay attention to this side of the room here? Oh. You, sir. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jamar Hill. I'm an Aston Communities uh, Healthy Communities Fellow from Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, building off of Arthur's question, where you have these districts with negative health determinants. Um, it seems like to provide access, it would be best if you could go directly into those communities. And as somebody coming from a community, um, could you expand on the relationship with municipalities and zoning and permitting that provides access for architects to come in and redesign the communities to bring those benefits directly to people? And if there are things that people within communities should be or could be doing to move your work forward? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, what comes to mind, you know, based in Chicago, as I mentioned, uh, actually the planning commissioner, um, Maurice Cox, he's a, trained as an architect. Um, he's been a mayor of a city, uh, mayor of Charlottesville, actually. Um, and then prior to uh, Chicago, he was the planning director in Detroit when I actually lived in Detroit and worked in city government. So I think about um, you know him coming to Chicago in 2019 with his design thinking and working in government and working with the mayor at that time to create Invest Southwest, which was designed specifically to look at, you know again, if you look at the map, um, the south and west sides where we have those greatest disparities, greatest issues, finding ways to pull together the public sector, the private sector, and the not-for-profit sector to go into those communities, have countless community engagement meetings, which you know, I, I applaud the city of Chicago for, for investing in that, finding out what the issues are, and then matching um, you know, resources from around the city. There's a very um, strong philanthropic community in Chicago. Government was willing. The private sector pitched in. And so that's a good example. Have we solved it? Clearly not, but I think we're, we're making strides. And I think wherever you are, um, that tri-sector collaboration is really important. And getting you know, designers, architects, planners um, together to kind of actually solve some of these issues is probably a really great path forward. Final thoughts, Michael? Um, well, I think I mean, it's interesting you from Anchorage. I mean, Anchorage, I think there's a lot of interesting things going on in Alaska around kind of health disparity and, um, and serving kind of a, a disparate population that's over a state that has not access to significant infrastructure. And the success in the healthcare uh, in Alaska, I think, is a, is a spatial manifestation of really creative design thinking, which is we need to serve communities directly, we need to give them full care. Uh, it affects their, not just the medicine that they're getting, but their kind of the social determinants of health. There's a lot of really interesting, I think, examples from that that the nation should be looking at Alaska uh, as, as a precedent that we could replicate in other rural communities around the world. So I'd like to learn more from you about ways in which uh, the spatial environment could be designed more effectively or, or is successfully working uh, in conditions in a place that's rural as Alaska. Thank you all for coming out. Let's uh, thank uh, Kim and Michael.